And we do know that, you know, evenings are difficult for people that are running in and running out and managing and uh, multitasking. So we'll give it a minute or so to let people um, sign in, just kind of monitoring. We've got almost 90 people signed up. So we're assuming we'll get a few more people. <laughs> have half. Yeah, well, best laid plans. We all know what happens sometimes, but we want to give everybody a chance. And you're going to hear us say this a few times if uh, you're not speaking, if you could mute, it would really help. It helps for a few things, you know, keeping a background noise down. And also, you know, at a certain point, we all want to see each other and be interactive. But while we're doing the question and answer part, sometimes turning your video out also helps with the, just the stream. Jennifer, does it look like we can get started? It does. I think we're it's about 7.01. So I think we um, could go ahead and go. Um, that's great. My name is Mary Kolick, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, um, uh, Chatham, Durham, and Orange League. And the education team has been working on this along with the superintendents for several months now. So we're really glad that over the next hour, we're going to be learning from our area superintendents about school budgets, the sources, the guidelines, the challenges and the opportunities that um, exist within budgeting. Uh, sometimes you say that you kind of measure what you treasure or you fund what you treasure. So it does reflect our visions and our priorities. Our goal tonight is that you leave feeling informed um, and also motivated to learn more and inspired to act as school advocates, public school advocates. This is really a 101 overview. We could be doing hours on budgeting because again, budgeting reflects priorities and needs and opportunities, but this is really an overview. We also ask the superintendents to really address questions that um, hit on topics that are common across our school districts. Uh, so we're going tonight to try to stay in that domain and also in the domain of budgeting and the priorities around budgeting. There's so much about education right now we could talk about. We are going to try to stay focused about that. Um, you will notice that although there are three counties, there are four school districts. And in a little bit, I'm going to be introducing the superintendents um, from the four school districts that are represented within our county. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce Jennifer Rubin, who is a member of the Board of League of Women Voters North Carolina and the Orange Durham uh, Chatham branch. And she's going to be telling us a little bit about the league and some priorities of the league. Thank you, Mary. I'm just trying to, there we go. Um, just wanted to, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, the League of Women Voters is a, a nonpartisan organization. We are the Orange, Durham and Chatham branch. I don't know why my computer is running ahead of me. Sorry about that. Um, we are uh, part of a state and national organization that has been around for 100 years, advocating for voters and advocating on behalf of issues that are important to us. Um, the League of Women Voters of Orange, Durham and Chatham counties has around 200 members. We are celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. And um, we are um, active in the fields of education and certainly voter services and and voter advocacy, um, as well as two of our, our priorities. Um, one of our flagship programs is Vote411, which is a voter services website that is available um, pretty much nationwide. Uh, this is, an organ this is a, a, a website that will give you information that you need for voting from where to vote, when to vote, and has uh, lots of um, information in 
candidate's own words in response to questions. So it's a, a great tool. And again, it's a, it's a nonpartisan uh, voter guide and hopefully everyone um, will take advantage of the information there, especially since primaries and early voting starts tomorrow. Um, so that is it for me. I will uh, turn it back to uh, Mary. So uh, we're going to let our superintendents, who are really the experts in this area, take the majority of the evening. But so many of us either have come from a different state or, quite frankly, just don't, you know, eat and breathe school funding issues. And so understanding public school funding and how it occurs in North Carolina, how it's set up in North Carolina, really is part of understanding your school district and the decisions that are made. And those of us that are often on a next door or on some social media and know about public school funding, see questions that you wish you could say, oh, if people just understood how this funding works. Um, so we're gonna try to hit that tonight. Just know that in many states, um, the split between the state and the local seems about even. That's not necessarily true in North Carolina. Commonly, the federal government only contributes a small amount, about 7% of the total school budget. So the remainder is picked up between the state and locals. And that could really is property taxes that fund it at the local level. Um, nationwide public schools spend about $14,455 per pupil. North Carolina, um, that's not true. In North Carolina, we spend about $9,000, $10,000 per pupil. We rank around 41st in our K through 12 spending. That's out of all of the states, 41st. And we're about 45th in our funding effort, which is your ability to pay um, taken into the context of what you actually do fund. So you can see that, um, one of the concerns that we have is that there's a long running issue about North Carolina's funding and our commitment to public schools. And we're gonna to speak to what is a court case that's surrounding that issue in just a second. If you wanna to go to the next slide. This is just one of those graphics that helps you understand that in North Carolina, the school district per student expenditures, again, about 60%, $6,600, from the state, the locals supplement, and that's based on taxes. And one of the equity issues I'm sure we'll speak about is that different communities uh, can contribute different amounts. And so there's an equity issue across the districts. Um, and then you see the federal uh, um, contributions as being just a very low percent. Uh, the school district expenditures you can see and what's been going on over time in terms of local expenditures and the percentage of each. And then again tonight, I'm sure at some point we'll speak about the fact that even though there may be an overall increase when you look at the cost of living and everything, and over time, you know, what does that really mean in terms of the direction of public school funding? So those are just, that's a framework um, and a little bit to think about. The real point is that so much of our, so much of the budgets of the public schools are funded at the state level. And in a companionship with that, there are a lot of parameters that the state puts on school districts in terms of how that money gets spent. Um, one more slide, again, another important piece of this, and we are just doing the fastest overview ever. But um, if you haven't heard the word Leandro, um, and I'd be surprised because it's been in the news quite a bit, but it's a long running 20 year court case that really looks at the um, question of the um, promise through the state constitution of a sound basic education for all students um, and whether we have met that um, guidance in that standard or not. The court said no. There's been a long discussion and much litigation around that. Recently, there was a dis, uh, comprehensive remedial plan that really spoke to what would it take to bring the state up to the level of meeting that promise for all of our students. Um, there was not only steps about the remediation, but there was a budget associated with that. There was a court case around that. And as of yesterday, there was a ruling in that court case that didn't necessarily clear things up, but that all, but that did at the 
very least identify that there's about $785 million in new spending that still should happen. How that will happen is up in the air at this point. The other important point about that is that this comprehensive remedial plan, also there's a, there is stipulations about, about how much money would come to each of our local districts. And that's an important part for people to understand with the full funding of Leandro and what it means in terms of what experiences our students and teachers have in the classroom. So that is the fastest overview that we can give you. And without further ado, we're going to turn it over to our superintendents. Um, I'd say that we are so fortunate in this area to be served by four superintendents whose resumes reflect the breadth of knowledge, the depth and range of experience, and the skills and deep commitment to ensuring growth and the development of learners. These are reflective of the highest standards. I read all of the um, resumes and have read backgrounds, and I will say to you that um, you know, we are so fortunate in this area to have experienced educators and educational leaders. Everybody's resume contains within it you know, just reams of experience at all different roles in leadership. Um, people are published, people are teaching at university levels, people are serving on state committees. So this is a learned and experienced group. Importantly, they have a record of promoting an ethic of care and an active dedication to equity and excellence that appears in every one of their statements and their resumes and their vision and the laudatory comments that people make about them. Um, and in order to get to their wisdom, I think I'm just going to do quick introductions for each one, and then we're going to start with the questions. Dr. Anthony Jackson is the superintendent of Chatham County Schools. He began his tenure with Chatham County in July 2021. So we are welcoming Dr. Jackson. It's his um, initial year. Um, he was named the 2020 um, Phillips North Carolina Superintendent of the Year. He has degrees in educational leadership and a background in his undergraduate is in music education. Before joining Chatham Schools, he was a superintendent of Vance County Schools. Um, he focused on graduation rate and I know implementing digital learning initiatives. Um, over the 30 year career, there's lots of roles and responsibilities that he's um, served in. Um, I will say that I happen to live in Chatham and um, I've heard him speak and the bottom line is always the same thing that I've read in everything that all of our superintendents have said. It's about our children and our learners and our school district meeting our, their promise for them in terms of being complete human beings. Um, Dr. Nyla Hammett is Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools uh, superintendent, and she also joined in 2021. Previous to that, Dr. Hamlet served as the chief of staff for Loudoun County, Virginia, and she's been at school level and central office level positions. She has a doctor in educational policy from College of William and Mary, several master's degrees and uh, educational leadership and also in reading. And she's got a BA in speech and language pathology. That being said that it's important the public understands that our administrators are not just administrators, they've been teachers and they've been in the classroom and they've been serving students across the board. Dr. Pascal Mumbenga is a uh, superintendent. And honestly, Dr. Mumbenga, you're the longest serving superintendent in our region. So you are our veteran. Um, he has been there uh, since 2017. He's been in numerous leadership positions. Um, his peers in 2021 awarded him the Regional Education Service Alliance Superintendent of the Year Award. Uh, he has been, you know, dedicated, I know, to the issues of equity, transformation, and leadership. He has degrees in um, mathematics from Shaw University in, term, in addition to leadership degrees. We're also welcoming Dr. Monique Felder, um, Orange County Schools. She joined in October 2019, I believe. Um, she has been following the path uh, that... I think was set upon her as a young person. She grew up in New York City and has been devoted to equity and excellence throughout her whole career. I think she's been in about 30 years, um, although you don't look like that. And she has received a number of awards. They were just listed across the page. All of them really speak to her dedication of um, student achievement and learning um, and also equity. She's been recognized with uh, awards for outstanding leadership. And she also 
uh, co-authored uh, Increasing Diversity in Gifted Education. I could go on, I will not. So I'm going to switch over. Welcome to each and every one of you. Um, if people wanna speak, uh, flip into the speaker view, we're gonna switch over to the questions and over the next 45 minutes, hopefully our superintendents will enlighten us. I know they will, and um, we will have some questions for them. Just so that you know the format, um, I'm gonna be introducing questions, kind of setting out the framework in terms of how to who answers and amount of time. And we're hoping by about 7.40 or so to flip into questions that the public is posing through our chat. But for the first question, and we're gonna ask each of you to respond to this Take you know two to three minutes to respond to this question. Um, it's it's a loaded one, and whoever wishes to go first, it's fine. And we just ask that you all respond. What is unique about your district budgeting, and what are some of the common misconceptions that the public may have about school budgeting? Monique, I see you, Dr. Felder. I see you're up on my screen, so I'm going to call on you first, and then we can move from there. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Um, so I think what is unique about um, funding in Orange County is that um, we are one of the, um, I believe we're in the top five of school districts with regards to um, uh, the amount that we receive through local uh, funding. Uh, but with regards to common misconceptions, I would say it's regarding flexibility. So unlike most businesses, uh, school districts are fairly restricted in how they can spend their budget. Um, the most restricted funds are um, not so much local as much as they are state and federal. Uh, and so with regards to um, this state, North Carolina, which I'm still learning, <laughs> uh, it uses an allotment system to distribute funds to uh, school districts. Uh, allotments are basically funds distributed based on student enrollment data uh, with limitations on how it's used. So in other words, the funds are received for a specific area, such as supplies and materials, transportation, teachers, teacher assistants, principals, et cetera, and cannot uh, typically be shifted from one area to another. And so sometimes that lack of flexibility uh, can limit our ability to uh, improve uh, innovation to support the needs of our and strengths of our students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'll go next. Uh, thank you, Mary, and uh, to all the um, women in the league. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you and um, uh, taking your wisdom as well as you advocate for us when you go to Raleigh. So I'm not going to repeat what my colleague uh, Dr. Felder said, but I'll say this is what is unique about Durham Public Schools. Uh, we are one of the few districts that is in a tier three. Uh, that means we are well-funded, but there are a lot of challenges that come with that. We are so unique that uh, uh, more than 60% of our students are free reduced. Uh, they get free reduced meal. More than 70% of our students are minority. And then we have 14 charter schools that are pulling students from our Durham area. And we have 37 uh, private schools in Durham only. And we have about 30 schools, charter schools that are pulling our students from Durham. So all these uh, brings a lot of challenges, even when you have to forecast your budget, even short and long-term, because you don't know how many students will be going to a growing homeschooling and private school, as well as the charter schools. So on top of that, you know, what I'm going to pretty much emphasize based on what my colleagues say, when you're looking at the formula, how we are getting funded, we have about 14% in Durham Public School of our students that are level uh, students with special needs. We have about 14% of our students that are level English learners. With all that growing population of uh, those students, and we have a cap of 12%, uh, I think it's 12.75, uh, that we can get funding when it comes to students with special needs. And then we have a cap of 10.6 when it comes to students with the English learners. But we have to go to local, our county commissioners, to be able to provide all those additional funding. 
So I think the state pretty much funding us maybe somewhere around 55%. And then we have to get about 40, I mean, 35% from local. Every year, our expenses, when it comes to local fund, keep on increasing because of uh, those caps that we have at the state level that uh, they don't want to remove those caps and our student population with those special needs keep on growing. Those are the challenges, even though we are well-funded, but we have some special needs that uh, are very unique in Durham area. Thank you. And so I'll, I'll go next. Good evening and thank you for the invitation. Uh, in, in, in Chatham, uh, I would say, and again, I won't repeat the things that are, are, are my colleagues have shared, uh, but one I would say is unprecedented growth for us. We're in, in the midst of seeing uh, a lot of growth in our county and having to be proactive and plan, and, which means that that places a different uh, view and a different uh, lens on long range uh, budget planning, uh, uh, for programming, uh, for uh, innovation, and those things that would come that you would like to be able to see. However, you've got to make sure that you are attending to those very basic needs. We are, uh, we have wide wealth and income disparities uh, in our, our district um, and uh, extremely diverse needs. Some of the large misconceptions, I think, um, that I've, I've seen in district, having served multiple districts in the state is, uh, that the, the funding flexibility that people really are not clear about where the money comes from. So I thank you for sharing that slide early on, because I think uh, having been a superintendent in Virginia and then a superintendent in North Carolina, it's very different. And when I hear people say uh, you should run school systems like businesses, I often uh, tell them to look at the funding structure uh, because in a business I would get a, a set of revenue and then I could match, I could then uh, put those in, in place and then match them out with appropriate expenditures. We get our money in buckets uh, and those buckets are very um, uh, specific in some cases. Uh, and then any bucket that's not filled, we have the ability to go to our local funders uh, to, to fill them. Uh, however, uh, if, there, if that resource is not there, then you have to then make, make do. Uh, I think most people, some of the misconceptions uh, are that the resources are plentiful, uh, particularly around uh, in the current climate where people hear that we have Esser's dollars uh, and we have federal money that could fill gaps that uh, are there. Uh, and I often tell people that those are dollars with deadlines. Uh, and once those dollars, there's a cliff that's going to come. And so you can't overcommit those dollars to uh, recurring funds when we know they're going, uh, recurring uh, events when we know those dollars are going to eventually disappear. Um, and then I think that uh, when it comes to budgeting, I think we still uh, yearn for the schools of yesteryear. Uh, and we want schools to look like they looked when we attended schools and we uh, are sometimes uh, not real clear on what the real investments are uh, that are required to maintain and to uh, deliver uh, the types of school programming programs that communities uh, uh, want right now. So I'll, I'll stop there, but there, there are lots of misconceptions and, and really I think there are more misunderstandings uh, about uh, what we're able to do uh, and, and how we're able to do it with the funds that we have. Thank you. Dr. Hamlet. All right, well, I guess I'll close us out on this question and good evening again, everyone. And thank you for having me. And so I, I was also gonna speak to the inflexibility um, and that being one of the, the common misconceptions. And I love what Dr. Jackson said about dollars with deadlines. And there are also those dollars with some significant restrictions, especially the state and federal funds that come our way. You know, it's, as he said, it's not just a general pot of money that the district can use, you know, however it, it deems appropriate. Um, one thing I will just share and add on to what my colleagues have shared about what's unique about Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools and I believe actually many of my colleagues are doing some of the same things, but we really believe that stakeholder input is crucial to budget transparency. And so, uh, you know, we've gone through a process where we make sure that there are various and many uh, diverse representatives of our schools and our community involved in the development of our annual budget. 
Um, our principals work with their school improvement teams, which include school leaders as well as parents and community members to identify and prioritize needs. Uh, one thing in Chapel Hill Carborough that we do require of our principals is as they go through that process of identifying needs, that they use the racial equity impact assessment tool, uh, recognizing that we have some pretty significant access opportunity and achievement gaps. We wanna make sure that we're using that tool to, to meet our needs in a differentiated way um, for our school community. And then I also uh, meet with a diverse group of, of a little over 30. Some uh, Last year was about 30, this year was a little over 40 um, secondary student representatives um, from every school so that I have the opportunity to incorporate student voice into our uh, budget development process. So those are just a few things that I think are, are a little bit unique, but again, I, you know, I would just echo what my colleagues said as well about the misconceptions. Well, it's amazing that in two to three minutes, you can all give us that much information. I've taken notes already, I have a page. So <laughs> we're gonna move on. Um, I think the question that often gets asked by people, especially people that don't have children in the public schools, whether by choice or because their families are grown or they don't have children. But why is public education an important and good investment, whether or not you use the services? And, um, well, you know, one or all can respond to that. And Dr. Hamlet, if you have a response to that, you, you know, you went last, you can go first if you'd like to kind of reverse our order a little bit. Sure, happy to do that, and I will keep it brief. Uh, there's a, a Joe Biden quote about, um, if you show me your budget, I'll tell you your values. Um, and if we value education and we value the future in our local community, um, you know, education is probably the most powerful change agent um, that helps to not just improve the outcomes for our students who graduate and go on into the workforce and college and careers, but also it improves health, um, it improves the livelihoods of our, you know, local community and really social stability and economic growth. So there are so many things that uh, education then feeds into and, and really becomes that foundation for a thriving community. So I'll just say again, show me the budget and we'll tell you the values. Thank you. Uh, I will echo pretty much the same sentiment. Um, public school is the cornerstone of our democracy, our community, as well as our economy. Um, if we don't pay for public school today, one way or the other, we're going to pay it in the future. It may not be in education, it may be uh, um, building prisons, it may be building, I mean, paying for some of us that will be retiring one day um, that we won't have enough because we did not prepare our future generation. So whether you have students in the public school today or not, uh, directly or indirectly, we're all going to be impacted by the products that will be coming from public school. So again, like Dr. Omlet said, uh, it's pretty much the cornerstone of our democracy. And uh, if uh, we all value all the citizens that we have in our neighborhood, in our community, in our country, we have to invest because if not, one way or the other, we're going to pay for it. That's right. Um, I'll, I'll jump in next. And uh, again, ditto and ditto uh, to what my colleagues have just said. Um, you know, the only thing more expensive than uh, investing in education is not investing in education. And uh, someone once said that, and I, I think those are very true words. Um, it is, you know, the research also shows what we invest um, in educating a child, we make back 10 times that amount in the long run. So again, uh, when we uh, don't uh, uh, in make the invest that investment, when it's inadequate, um, the cost is high in terms of public spending, crime, health, um, economic growth, et cetera. And so it is the right investment uh, for our country. So uh, again, I'll, I'll just close it up that uh, it's really about, um, uh, I see it as deposits and withdrawals. Uh, we have to make deposits so that we might be able to make withdrawals at a time when we uh, need the system to support us. We're going to need uh, doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, everyone else 
later at a time when we um, are not in school. And so our, we make the deposits now so that when we have to make the withdrawals, I want to make sure that we have a well-educated citizenry so that when, I, uh, when I'm in the uh, 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 later part of my life, when I'm no longer involved in, in uh, public schools, I can depend that our, our children have been prepared. Uh, you invest in the nursery uh, so that you can enjoy the nursing home. That's the best way that I, I can, I can uh, phrase that. Uh, and so it's really about um, uh, deposits and withdrawals. Uh, public education uh, for every single child is an opportunity uh, for, to, uh, for upward mobility, for outward mobility, and for pr prosperity. If they're willing to work and give the time to making sure if they invest in themselves, they're going to reap a, a benefit. Uh, and so we have to then create the space for them to do that uh, and to do that and to provide quality opportunities for them uh, to engage and to do that work. Thank you all. Uh, you know, I think you laid out the, the kind of moral imperative and the greater economic and community good. And I guess I'll add one little thing that in talking to my neighbors, we've always said, even if it's from the selfish perspective, it really does help your home value too. So, you know, even if you these greater calling, you know, and you've put it so perfectly, you know, we, we might want to look, you know, in our own home too. So lots of reasons, but thank you so much. Um, next question. As many people and articles compare the current spending with that of a decade ago, um, how has funding changed over time and how has that impacted both the public schools and our perception of our you know, funding of public schools? I'll go first. Uh, those of us that have been in North Carolina, if we're looking at recession that uh, took, let's say, 2008, and then if you can look at the funding from 2008 to now, uh, 14 years later, uh, we, are, we have been really funded less than what we used to be funded back in 2008. Um, I will just single out one particular example. When it comes to uh, the employer contribution to the teacher retirement, that is pretty much double. And the employer have to pick up on that tab while the funding that we've been receiving since 2008 has not uh, increased. So pretty much has declined. So it's been with a struggle um, as uh, we, we, I mean, when you look at the whole Leandro case, um, it's really a valid case. Uh, we have been really funded less than we used to be funded 14 years ago. Um, with funding, as uh, my colleagues said before, as they're coming in the buckets and all that kind of stuff. So it's making it's making really hard for us even to be able to bring innovation in the classrooms because everything is really restricted. And some of the funding that we used to receive when it comes to textbooks and so forth, we're getting now less than what we used to receive back in 2008. So it's making it really harder. We have to not only educate students in the best of uh, academic needs, now we're addressing social, emotional needs but the funding is not really matching the expectation that we're having from the community. Yeah, I, I would I would further add to that uh, that as we the, the the impact of the recession of two thousand eight, we never res there was never a reset, and so now you add on heap on top of that the impact of of a pandemic, uh, and while again we've gotten temporary dollars that may that'll solve for for a short period of time. But in reality, when it has not kept pace with um, uh, inflation in terms of those kinds of dollars, you look at the retirement, con those, fixed, uh, at, uh, those fixed costs have just continued to escalate. Uh, and so it, it has crippled, I think, a lot of the, the standard areas of the budget that will make a difference in terms of human capital, uh, in terms of being able uh, to offer programming. Um, uh, you, you've got, we've got to be far more strategic now uh, having, uh, I was a superintendent during the last recession, and so I've seen both the impact of both. What I rec what I what I realize, or what I will say, has probably been the the greatest uh, impact. In addition to those economic uh, pressures, uh, is probably the the um, uh, rescission or the, um, the the loss of flexibility with those resources, uh, because they in 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 fact, as we have lost. Um, 
Uh, we may have gained a few more dollars in those areas, but with those, those costs that have escalated and the loss of flexibility, it's made it far more difficult to do some of those things that we've done uh, uh, before. And I think um, uh, the expectation has remained the same, that we will continue to offer the same level of of our services, but when you look at things like textbooks uh, and uh, professional learning, I mean, there's zero, te technically we get nothing for professional development. We have to find those resources either locally or go to grant funding, use our federal dollars uh, in most cases for that. Uh, so there, there are challenges that were heaped on that maybe you won't see in the actual dollar amount, but when you look at impact, they definitely crippled our abilities to continue to offer uh, the same level of service uh, um, uh, to uh, that our communities have, have, have come to expect. And as you know, if other people want to add in and certainly build upon those um, answers. The other question that relates to this, and I think Dr. Mbengu brought it up, was um, with the funding of Le the Leandro Comprehensive Plan, would this make a difference for your districts? I'll see you. Yeah, I was going to go ahead, uh, Dr. Hamlet. I was just going to add that uh, from that last question, uh, one of the things you spoke about was the funding for textbooks and professional development. I think, and like much like Dr. Felder, I'm still learning what I call the North Carolina way. Um, but uh, uh, from what I understand, over the past decade or so, per people spending has declined uh, about 6% in North Carolina, which I believe puts us at the sixth. Uh, lowest in the nation with per people expenditures. And so to uh, Dr. Jackson's point, little investment has been made to expand school resources like allotments for instructional support or, or, or teaching assistant positions, um, textbooks, uh, at risk or at, at promise student services. Um, all of those things are either below or more than below the 20 2008-2009 per, per pupil expenditures. Um, so with that said, I just think that, you know, a lot of that really leads to stagnant salaries. Um, it leads to a workforce that has just increasingly become frustrated and, and more willing to find employment in other industries. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's been it's been a challenge. And I think, you know, with the uh, to your qu other question about the Leandro uh, plan and what that would mean to our district, you know, one of those things is, you know, having professional learning and having high quality educators um, who have training. Um, so to Dr. Jackson's point, without the adequate funding for professional learning and having the flexibility and funding to determine what works best for Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools, what works best for Durham and, and so on, um, without that flexibility, it becomes a, a major challenge. I too would like to address the uh, previous question. And so in Orange County, we are certainly seeing a shift um, of more local funds being needed to support schools than we have previously. Uh, so the state only covers what they allocate from their formulas uh, for what's needed in schools. And uh, those formula, formulas aren't adequate for the needs of our students. Uh, so for example, in Orange County Schools, we supplement our staff salaries locally. Um, and um, so as a result, more local funds are needed to implement com uh, competitive uh, supplements to recruit and uh, sustain uh, staff. And uh, with regards to uh, Leandro, uh, um, uh, seeing that fulfilled would certainly benefit um, Orange County, all school districts in North Carolina bringing um, funding, additional funding for critical areas such as classroom teachers and teacher assistants, uh, both uh, instructional and non-instructional support, um, students with disabilities, uh, English language learners, transportation, et cetera. So, uh, well, and I, I would only say, I bring probably a very unique perspective to the Leandro conversation, having led previously a Leandro district. And so first of all, I wanna say that we're extremely fortunate in Chatham County to have a great uh, relationship with our school board and our county commissioners and their commitment to um, uh, doing the absolute best they can to fund public education. 
but when I look at the estimates that uh, on the um, on the uh, website that uh, uh, will tell you if if Leandro were fully funded, what that could mean for Chatham County, uh, we're talking about an infusion of nearly two million dollars um, for 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 um, uh, Chatham County. Um, and when I think about what the what that would have meant in my previous district and what it would mean here, it really does mean that we can help our community and our parents deliver on the hopes and dreams of their children. Uh, and so Leandro uh, is, is our opportunity, I believe, uh, to really um, uh, uh, realize the, 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 the expectations of our state constitution around public education. Uh, and, and if you've not looked at that data um, um, on, the, um, um, on, this, on the website that uh, gives you the estimates, I can't think of the name of it right now, education, uh, I can't think of the exact name of it, but you, should, you could see what the impact would be from pre-K all the way to K-12. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it would mean an, an, an overall uh, tangible investment in ensuring that we are delivering our constitutional, uh, yes, every child in C, thank you. Um, uh, our, our constitutional obligation to every child in this state, regardless of their zip code. We have a few more questions and it's certainly a closing question, but I wanted to make sure that we had time to pose some questions that are coming from our audience. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn and then Carolyn, if we can come back somewhere around 7.52 or so, you know, that'll give us time for our last couple of questions. Okay. Um, it looks like there's a few questions in the chat and one that I thought directly relates to what everybody's been talking about. Um, what are two areas in your school budget that are underfunded by the state that could make the biggest impact? Well, as I shared uh, previously, um, one of those areas would be around um, a budget for uh, staffing and uh, salaries. Um, so uh, that uh, certainly is an issue uh, for us here in Orange County uh, schools. Uh, I will echo pretty much the same sentiment in Durham. Uh, when you look at a budget across the state, we spend pretty much about 85% in personnel. So more funding to us is gonna help us really to have more teachers and more IAs. Uh, keeping in mind, in my case, when we're dealing with Durham Public School, we have a lot of students that are pretty much reading at two or three years behind. Having additional staffing, that will go a long way so that we can really pinpoint on supporting them on the core instruction as well in remediation. And then again, when we're still talking about personnel at the high school level, for us to be able to really keep track of those students, having more uh, school counselors, one per 250 students, I think that's gonna serve us really well to be able to track those students as they matriculate to high school, be able to keep them on track until they go to graduation. Bulk of the funding definitely is going to help us to be really competitive when it comes to uh, retaining and recruiting really quality teachers. Yeah, I would just echo what both of my colleagues have said as it relates to staffing and salaries. You know, um, many people talk about the great resignation and that's really happening across the country and not just, um, you know, in education, but certainly in education, it's been exacerbated by, you know, the many challenges. Um, and here in the research triangle area, we find ourselves competing for an ever shrinking pool of qualified education workers. So, and like I said, while simultaneously trying to retain existing staff. So, you know, really just being able to pay our staff and, and um, really show the value of the work that they do and their appreciation for the investment that they're making in our future. Um, so strengthening employee compensation is, is paramount and that would be the, the top of my list. I would also say, you know, our county commissioners and our school board 
are also very supportive and, and try, you know, to do what they can to advocate for additional funding and mm -hmm. uh, provide those resources for the lower ratios for our EC, our exceptional children staff, for our uh, school counselors and our structural support staff. So we are really blessed in Chapel Hill, Clarborough and in Orange County um, to have commissioners and uh, board members that work together to really provide those resources. But again, I would just say, you know, uh, piggybacking off of what my colleague said, really that highly competitive market and trying to, you know, um, pay our people and show that appreciation is, is paramount. Yes. I, I would ditto the compensation piece and, and balancing that, but I would also add around professional learning. I think the expectations for um, uh, what we need our professionals to deliver uh, will continue to um, uh, increase. And I believe, I'm a, just a firm believer that um, training is important. Uh, that because with training, you, you get a longer and, and more uh, uh, a pronounced impact with the resources that you invest. And so I really think that if we could get into a cycle of ensuring that uh, we are training teachers well. We understand that our, our, our workforce is challenged right now, but I think if we invest not only in the compensation, we can pay people, but I think people want to do a good job. They want the, the, um, uh, the honor of knowing that I've done well, that, I've, that I've, I've been successful at this job. And what gives them more confidence than having the skills uh, and the, the, the necessary uh, background in those areas? Uh, to to provide excellent instruction in classrooms every day and to feel uh, that they are, in fact, um, making a difference in the lives of kids. I would love to see us get back to a place where we are honestly investing in the long-term training of our teachers so that we can have the long-term impact that we want uh, for student outcomes. Well, Dr. Jackson, let me piggyback from that point as well. I think turnover is really hurting us. We're spending, we can spend a lot of money training, but as they're living, as we have that revolving doors, it takes a research says it takes about six or seven years really to be able to, to train and be able to have a qualified person. And once that person lives, it takes a lot of money to be able to replace that person. All of us here living in a triangle area, when you're looking at state salary, about $36,000. And depending on how much supplement from one district to the other. So you're looking at about 41, maybe $42,000. It's really hard to live with that kind of money. Maybe in the east part of the state with a cost of living, that can work. But in the triangle area, it's really hard. Uh, about a year ago in Durham Public School, and thank you to our county commissioners, we got all our employees minimum pay $15 an hour. Now $15 an hour. Uh, the part of the state may work in the triangle area is not going to work. We're competing with Amazon and other places. We have to get our minimum pay to $20 if you really want to live in a triangle area. So it's really complicated. And uh, I agree with Dr. Jackson. Training works really well. Compensation, having both, that's going to reduce our turnover from our staff. Yeah. Um, some of the other questions are not as related to the budget, but uh, one that could be is what what do you say to legislatures or legislators or parents who claim that public education is failing? That's a good question. I don't think so. We're not failing. Um, if you look at history of uh, public school, I don't want to go back in common school back in the 1800. Our legislatures in North Carolina, they have not been able to help us to be successful. So the way we started with charter schools with a cap of 100, it was for them to be able to learn all this new stuff, innovation, then bring them to public schools. Once you remove that cap, I have to give money or pay money to charter school. My students that are leaving us, while I still have those fixed costs, building, maintenance, I still have those to maintain those in my district while the fund, funding is going with students that are living during public schools. Mm -hmm. So if our legislatures, they really wanna be honest and sit down with us, 
they are the one that are really making public school to fail. But I'm not saying that we're failing because we are really defined, not defined, we are resilient, that we're gonna do everything that it takes to make sure that our students are successful. We're not failing our students, even some of the innovation that they think they are implementing, opening all these charter schools, I don't think those innovation has been really successful in the state. We can look at the data, we can look at the data from the public schools, anybody can come up with those conclusions. They are not succeeding more than public schools. So if we can all sit down together, being honest with one another and bring all the issues that we're discussing about compensation, we have teachers that are leaving us left and right because our state is not paying master, master pay anymore. It's making it really hard. While charter schools, they have the flexibility to employ folks that are coming from other professions, engineers, they have those flexibility to bring those staff, 50% of their staff, they don't need to be certified, but we don't have those flexibility in the public schools. If they're going to leverage, make sure that they're treating all of us in the same manners, I think public school will never fail. That has been the cornerstone of democracy, has been around here. I think we're gonna continue being really resilient to make sure that all our students are getting what has been promised by the constitution, the sound basic education. That's right. So I would, I would, uh, uh, if faced with that question or that that uh, perception, I encourage you to come visit our schools. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can show you success story after success story after success story, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't have to convince you. Our students are doing well. I am, I am absolutely uh, bullish on this generation of kids. I believe that they're going to prove to us uh, that we are holding on to a time that doesn't uh, necessarily uh, fit. Uh, what they need, uh, that their that their futures are far brighter uh, than our what we what we hold dear in our past, uh, and I believe that it's going to be very very important for those who uh, I, I I don't believe that uh, anybody um, uh, you you can't look a success story in the face and say it's a failure, and so I've got kids I can show you we have. Uh, students who are still winning the top awards. We have students going to some of the best universities in this country. We have students who are, who are, who are maxing out and doing well. We have uh, students and, 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 and teachers who still love their jobs. Do we have challenges? Yes, uh, but our challenges don't define us. And so we have to be willing to say, we embrace the challenge, we wanna work on those, but we also recognize that in this system, this system is working for a lot of our kids and we have to make sure that we continue to make it work for more of our kids and remove barriers and obstacles so that it works for all of our kids. And so I would I would just invite anyone who thinks that public schools are failing, come visit, take a walk with me. I'll show you uh, some of the best uh, teaching and learning going on in this country right here in Chatham County. Yeah, I, um, you know, I actually take offense at uh, that statement. Um, you know, to, ja to, to Dr. Jackson's point, um, yes, there are challenges, but um, uh, we are, as a industry, really working hard to ensure that all of our children succeed. Um, uh, the challenges and, and not to, you know, uh, certainly there were pre-COVID challenges, uh, COVID certainly added another layer, a very deep layer of challenges on, but you know, I can certainly speak to the work that we're doing here in Orange County Schools. Um, our board, um, with the support of our board and uh, county commissioners, our teachers, uh, our bus drivers, um, child nutrition service workers, there's not a, uh, an employee that is not working diligently every day on behalf of, of our students. And so, um, we are doing some great work here. Uh, we are doing some great work right in this triangle uh, region, uh, despite the challenges. And uh, you know, it's quick to and very easy to point a finger at, at what's not working, but come and see what is working. And so, um, uh, yeah, I find that to be a very uh, a disturbing uh, a comment. And um, uh, there's a lot of great things happening in our schools. I'll just piggyback off of that just a bit and again keep it brief our students have defined success for themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it depends on how uh, whomever legislators parents community members, however they're defining failure. Um, our students have really defined what success means they've defined what resilience looks like they've defined, um, you know, really 
or redefined what their expectations are of the adults who are here to serve them every single day. And as Dr. Felder said, we have some amazing employees who invest in our children, who, you know, love on our children, who help them to, you know, be a part of that success story and prepare them for life. You know, there are some who are prepared for college. There are some who are prepared to go right into the workforce. There are others who have, you know, who come out of high school with certifications and making, you know, $80,000 a year. Um, so, you know, again, I would just say it, our students have this defined success for themselves. And um, like Dr. Jackson said, just come and take a walk in any of our school buildings and you'll see many success stories. And the student's voice is what matters most. Um, you know, whenever I have people come in and, and observe in our classrooms and in our schools, the best thing to do is to talk to students and not even worry about what the adults have to say, again, because students are the ones who are defining what success looks like. Your um, sincerity and your actions and your passion. Um, honestly, I'm a little choked up, you know, just because it, you know, it matters. You can hear in your voices and you have given us specifics about why this matters, not to each only individual child, but to all of us as a community and as a nation and certainly members of the global community, this matters. So um, you've been extraordinarily articulate around the questions. We have one last one that we'd like to pose to all of you because we said we wanted to not only inform and inspire, um, but also give some specifics. So the final question is, what actions can audience members take to keep informed about public school budgeting and how can they help locally with budget needs? I would say educate yourselves uh, on on the on the real uh, numbers. Um, and second, I would say advocate uh, and recognize that in most of our cases, we are the largest um, public employers uh, in our areas. And so we can't run schools like uh, small mom and pop organizations. They're complex organizations with tremendous needs uh, and needs that are seen and some are, are not seen. So we have to be uh, nimble and recognize that it's going to take an awful lot. We all recognize the challenges that have been before us. And so in order uh, for us to actually um, level set and, and reset uh, it's going to take some investment to support our students, to support our employees, uh, and ultimately to give our communities the, the product uh, uh, that they expect from us. And so I would say advocate, educate, uh, and, and most importantly, you know, be willing to understand that uh, education is going to look different. Uh, as we move into what I call this post-COVID, uh, our post-COVID reality, it's going to look different. And so we're going to have to be nimble enough to recognize that education is going to look different uh, in terms of where, how, uh, and in and, and places like that, and that different is not deficient. Uh, that we're going to have to do things in one part or do things differently uh, than we've ever done before to ensure that our kids uh, have the opportunities that are coming uh, uh, our way. Dr. Hamlet talked about not every kid's going to go to a four-year college. So we have to adjust our, our thinking and adjust our programming to support their needs, uh, not as a default, um, but, but as an opportunity. We have to then talk about those kids who are going to go to a four-year college and make sure. So our, it, it's, it, we're, we're, uh, we're running complex organizations. And so we need the flexibility. We need the support so that we can, in fact, uh, 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 do the things that our communities expect. And that starts with advocacy, advocating that uh, we have the flexibility we need to make this thing work for all kids. Yeah, I, I would just say that we can't um, emphasize advocacy enough, you know, so just being engaged with your school district and your board of education, um, engaging in and looking at and reviewing those budget documents and asking the tough questions and um, look at the different materials that are prepared regarding the budget. All of those things are posted publicly. 
um, and they contain a lot of information that's important to understanding the whole budget development process and ultimately what the final budget looks like. Um, and then I would also say as part of that engagement, attending board meetings, county commissioner meetings, and the public hearings regarding the budget process, because that's really where, as Dr. Jackson just shared, where the advocacy begins. And so um, I think it's really important to educate, as he said, engage, and then continue to advocate on behalf of your district and in collaboration with your school district. So piggyback, I think I just wanna remind all of us when it comes to educating our students in our state is the responsibility of the state, not locally. So we have been pushing down those responsibilities. And then we'll see folks really putting a lot of pressures on county commissioners to properly fund schools. Yes, they have been really generous to us. Uh, they've supported us where the state have come short. Please, when we're talking about advocacy, don't just put a lot of pressure on county commissioners, but we also need to go to the state. Yeah, and um, again, I would just echo everything that uh, my colleagues have said. Um, cannot say enough about advocacy. Um, and in order to do that, one needs to stay informed. And there's a lot of information uh, that is um, made available uh, to the public. Don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, you know, again, you know, board meetings, there's a lot of information provided there as well. Um, and, um, you know, I would just say that, um, you know, there's also a lot of misinformation that's out there. Um, and, um, and so, um, yeah, again, that advocacy and staying informed is critically important. And any other ways that you can think of to uh, support our schools, I mean, from volunteering, mentoring, uh, we're open. Uh, this is, um, it, it truly takes a village and, um, you know, we're certainly open to um, uh, all types of ways and methods to uh, be of support to our, our schools, to our students, to ensure that um, uh, their hopes and dreams are realized. So thank you. Well, thank you to um, all of you. It's been a tremendous evening. I'm so glad we taped this and really um, would encourage all of us that are on this uh, presentation to share this with our friends, colleagues, acquaintances, neighbors, um, and that we will distribute it, you know, certainly through our website. The League of Women Voters has a position um, for public education that we encourage you to go on our website and look at. Uh, so many people contributed to this evening. Thank you to all of your assistants who have been tremendous in terms of staying in touch with us. Every person that works for a school district, every person, custodians, food service, bus drivers, assistants, teachers, you know, administrators um, contribute to the well-being of every student in the community and they deserve to be supported and resourced. And your vision that you've shared with us that has taken us beyond our understanding of what is needed right now, but into the future um, has just been um, inspirational. So our goal was to be informed and inspired and activated. So we would encourage to go out you know, go out, get to know your district. You know, when you hear something that sounds odd, ask them, you know, don't just, you know, ask, don't go in next door, go to the school district and ask the school district. That's probably our best bet. And tonight, the quality of your presentation tonight speaks to that. And um, also because we're the League of Women Voters, we'd also remind people to please register and vote. It matters, it's a democracy and educated voters are the foundation of today and our future. So um, if there's nothing else that anybody has to add for the good of the order, we're gonna thank you. And we brought it in a little three minutes over, but not too badly, but thank you all for being here tonight. We tremend you're tremendous, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Good night.